Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a fun show for you this evening. Elena Lewis of Culver Props is here to talk about all the wonderful things that go around her world, her family, aviation, and of course, the making of wooden propellers. And before we get started, as always, just a few notes. Tonight's broadcast will be recorded and will be available on Social Flight's YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and do a search on one word, Social Flight. In addition to that, of course, be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. For Apple and Android devices, these give you tens of thousands of aviation events, destinations, in-person events, which are making a comeback right now, which is so wonderful. And in addition to that, of course, online events, like tonight's show and many other educational webinars and programs. And when you fly, you can fly the, with, using uh, the mobile app and enter in the Fly to Win Challenge, where even going to one airport and getting some points by doing so can get you entered in to win a prize. And we have given away literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of prizes. It is so, so cool. And uh, the prize we're giving away right now in this current period is a uh, custom set of Flying Eyes Eyewear. You choose and you'll be able to get a custom set made for you. And again, very simple. It's all free. And all you need to do is uh, fly to an airport with the Social Flight app. So with that, I would like to uh, begin talking about tonight's program and who we have on with Elena Lewis. I'm going to... Uh, bring in here while I do her bio here. Let's uh, do this the right way. Sorry about that. The uh, Let's see if we can get this to work properly. There we go. <laughs> Thanks for that. So with Elena Lewis of Culver Props, she is the third generation aviation enthusiast and propeller maker in her family. She runs Culver Propellers from Rolla, Missouri. Her father and grandfather bought Culver Props in 2000 where she worked and learned the ropes from her grandfather, Gene. In 2016, Gene passed away and uh, Elena took over manufacturing of the propellers and has since expanded to build propellers for everything from ultralights up to full-scale World War I replicas of her own design. And so with that, I would like to uh, bring Elena online. Let's uh, do that right now. There we go. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> We're great, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us here on Social Flight Live. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So, uh, I mean, where to start? I, you know, the, there is so many amazing things that go in the story uh, of you and your family and what goes into making a prop that I wanted to start with with you and with your background. So tell me a little bit about it because it's, it's way more than propellers that puts uh, general aviation in your family's blood. Yeah, so... Um, it kind of all started, my grandpa was, um, he was actually in the Air Force, and then he um, he bought a farm, and he decided to be a crop duster. So he bought an airplane, and he started crop dusting off of the family farm, and um, after about 20 years of crop dusting, he had a heart attack, so he lost his medical. Um, but he also had a mechanical engineering degree. So at that point in time, he just went ahead and designed his own ultralight. Um, at that point in time, there was a two-place um, ultralight trainer version that you could make and not have any license or anything. So he did that. He just designed and built himself his own ultralight. And we kind of grew up working on it. Um, he did that when I was about in kindergarten. So starting wow. about in kindergarten, it's kind of like nights and weekends. We're down at the farm and you help build the airplane. You held pieces of aluminum while they welded it. You um, sanded aluminum before it was covered. You picked all the glue off grandma's hands afterwards. That's just kind of <laughs> starting there. So then he actually flew that to Oshkosh. So he flew his open cockpit ultralight to Oshkosh, two years in a row, actually. Um, what was it called? What was the aircraft called? Um, they ended up calling it the, the backyard flyer, but they were just his own designs. So, oh my um, goodness! Yeah, <laughs> I want to make sure we stop for a second and go back because you you went really quickly through some pretty amazing things to begin with. So, 
to buy a farm and then make the decision at the same time that you're going to go into crop dusting for your own farm. Was he already a pilot? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'll have to ask dad that. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you remember days when he was first into the, into the crop dusting side of it? No. So that was way before I was born. Um, but it, so my, my, he had four kids, um, and my dad and my grandma, um, did most of it. It's kind of like all the kids woke up and they would, you know, clean the runway off cause they had cattle. So you clean the runway off <laughs> then dad would help load all the chemicals. That's my grandma's favorite story to tell. So then my dad would help and my grandma would help load all the chemicals and, um, they'd sleep on the barrels until they heard grandpa come back. They'd fill him back up and he'd go crop dust some more. And, um, that, but that was all way before I was born. Yeah. So um, it's still it's such a wonderful, wonderful story. It, it, including when, when you face adversity, the ability to turn around and say, I'm, I'm just going to roll up my sleeves and do something a little bit different and create something for general aviation. Yeah. So he flew it to Oshkosh a couple times, his ultralight, and then he, um, someone said, is, is, there's VW powered. And they said, well, is that the best climb out you can do? And so grandpa went home on a mission. And so <laughs> at that point, he developed a prop speed reduction unit for the VW engine. Um, so what that did was instead of swinging like a 62 inch prop, which is the max a direct drive VW can swing because of tip speed issues, um, he was able to swing a 96 inch prop. Oh my so, goodness. He came back to Oshkosh and he did his, you know, super big takeoff and uh, all the guys on the ground were like, you've got to stop that. You're going to stall, you know, like, you know, all the things before stole was a thing. And he got in trouble and he's like, that's okay. Only needed to do it once. So <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he did that and, and it went well. So we sold a few VW engines. Um, one of the things is people get into the World War One replicas. World War I replicas are known for their large diameter propellers, but modern engines can't swing a prop that big. So we kind of got into the World War I replicas um, because we could have like a 96 inch prop on their planes and they looked more period specific. So um, that's kind of actually what snowballed it all. And actually Grandpa had a specific propeller designed by Culver for his reduction drives. And so, um, when they went out of business, we jumped in with it and um, bought the company, and that's how we ended up where we are. But yeah, so basically everything that I do, everything that every is all based on the foundation that Grandpa gave me. So um, <laughs> my uh, Grandpa was definitely an amazing, amazing guy um, with lots of drive and lots of, and my dad is a force of nature as well. Is <laughs> the only way to explain to him. So. My grandpa was a little bit of a mad scientist, and then my dad could make anything work. He can he can weld anything. He can he can make anything happen. So between the two of them, they laid a pretty pretty awesome way to grow up, and uh, <laughs> that's how I got where I am. <laughs> oh my God, that is so wonderful, and I love the stories. I mean, you know, a lot of people will say that some of the some of the most incredibly mechanically astute people are are farmers come from farmers and knowing how to fix things and build things and create things. And it sounds like uh, your grandfather was that to a T and gave that to his son as well. And now it's down to you. Yep. Now it's down to me. <laughs> wow. So, so to understand, so this went from crop dusting to not being able to fly to then create your own ultralight, the whole plane to then improve on it for climb out by making your own prop speed gear reduction. And then, that led to the need for to continue an existing company of Culver Props, and that's how you guys purchased it. Did I get that right? Yeah. So, um, so in between that, he made his first design, but Grandpa probably designed um, probably ten or fifteen different airplanes that he designed. You know, because he is an engineer, and and it's really what kept him going. Um, you know, all the way till when he passed away when he was like eighty three. So. Basically, um, you know, he designed several, several different airplanes, but then when the LSA rules came into effect and there was no longer a two-place ultralight, it was an even bigger challenge for him to design an ultralight with a four-stroke engine and electric start. 
So then he started developing those and um, we made a few, a, a few of those. So I think overall he's made about, he made and designed probably 30, 30 airplanes of his own. Uh, and I got to cover them. So I, I do a little bit of covering work, which is fun. Um, but yeah, that's about how it went. It's all whirlwind, like grandpa like said. <laughs> so <laughs> I was super lucky to grow up with him for a grandpa that's amazing and so tell so so then the beginning of Col of uh, your family taking over Culver props uh, ha happened tell me about that transition um, so they bought the company roughly in 2000 so I was still in high school um, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it I can remember unloading the trucks I can remember um, dad working on a few of them but he had um, some guys work for him and they built stuff. And then um, I did one year at college, did not care for that. <laughs> Didn't care for being away from home basically. So I moved back home and went to college locally. So I only have my associates in business. That's actually all the, all the secondary education I have. And then, um, but I just helped in the shop. So I would clean up, I would go get them lunch, I would, just basically anything that nobody else wanted to do, I did it. <laughs> and eventually I get to do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, and then some days no one would be at the shop. So then I could do whatever I wanted to. And those were my favorite days. And because <laughs> the best days are when no one can tell you no. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I got a sign yeah. made up that the best days are when no one can tell you no. That's exactly, yeah. that, by the way, that's what you're writing on the prop, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, so then I, I I got you know to do more and more stuff as I got older, and uh, then we had kids, and Grandma took care of the kids right there in the shop. So I took the kids to work with me every day, and Grandma would watch them, and and it was just great great way for my kids to grow up too. So they grew up in the shop just just like I did, and. I enjoyed the way I grew up, so I hope they do. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you from the videos and the pictures and things like that, if anyone's out there, go check out uh, the website for Culver Props and you'll see. I, I'm pretty sure they're they're doing fine. <laughs> they, they look Thank pretty you. damn happy if you ask me. So do, <laughs> do you think like when you were, you're in high school, they're buying the business, do you think in those early days they had any idea that at the end of the day when this was all over, basically you'd be the one running all this? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. I think I was going to, I was going to be a cosmetologist or a nurse or a vet or something like that. Prop maker was never on my list. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure glad it is because uh, I, I want to show some pictures of the propellers that you make before we get into more of the story and figure it out because, and you've got a couple of them right next to you there too, right? Oh, like, yep. I yeah, have two here. <laughs> which, which, which all have stories to to say the least let me just let me just give people a, a, an idea here of uh, uh, of this I'm gonna share this time I think it's gonna work I'm gonna share here a couple pictures these are a few different propellers that you do pretty pretty dramatic different shapes and sizes of what come out of your your shop yeah um, so the one, um, it'd be my left, um, is a replica for a Curtis headless pusher. So that's a design from like 1909. Um, and I had a, um, a customer, Lee Fisher, he came up and he said, hey, um, I want to replicate one. And can you replicate the prop? Here are some uh, museum drawings of what it needs to look like. And so, but I need it to work on a modern engine. So I took the pictures he sent me and I... Um, redesigned that blade profile and made it work for his engine. <laughs> and then, um, so the middle one is for an SE5 replica, and he was using a Chevy engine on that. So again, um, a very specific design he wanted for his airplane, but also having to modify it so that it worked on a modern engine. And a lot of times that uh, gets tricky because you're kind of looking at things like um, the RPMs are different and stuff like that. So the length has to be different and the pitch has to be different. And sometimes that can change the profile. So you have to really um, do a lot of research that comes with doing those um, because pretty is great, um, but 
it's not done its job unless it performs properly. So people can tell me my props are pretty all day long and that's great and I appreciate it. Um, but if they don't work, then I really haven't done my job. So that's the that's the tricky part about that. And then the one on the very right is for a Demazel. So Demont Santos Demazel replica. Wow, yeah, very, very different uh, propeller. So to talk about that for a minute because I think as you mentioned, it's it's very easy for uh, those of us who just fly behind the propeller to admire it and look at how beautifully it's put together, maybe how well it kind of like weathers things and, and, and holds together over time. But at the end of the day, when it, you do something very unique, people come to you with, here's, here's my plane, here's the engine that's there, and you create a propeller for that or choose based on, on things that you know how to put together the right propeller for that. How, how is that done? So, okay, there's, there's a couple different ways you can look at it. Um, number one, it's your cruising RPM and mile per hour is what I use. Every propeller maker does it differently. So don't take anything that I say and think that this is the way that, that any other company does it. So um, cruising RPM and mile per hour is where you are most of the time. So those are the numbers that I take whenever I determine your pitch. Um, then after I determine your pitch, I'll also take the max number. So your max cruising RPM and mile per hour. And I want to make sure that that gives me the same pitch because basically your propeller is you get one gear in your airplane. So I need to make sure that both measurements give you one pitch so I know that we're both in the same gear <laughs> at, at both ends of the spectrum. Um, so that'll usually give me my pitch. Then the second thing I look for is the diameter that you need. Um, diameter is um, determined by two things. Tip speed. Um, you don't want to go over really over 850 feet per second at max RPM. The other thing that you want to look at is ground clearance. So some airplanes are physically limited to a shorter prop. Um, so that's the first thing I ask people is what kind of ground clearance, how, how big of a prop can you swing? You want to swing a big prop because the bigger column of air you're pulling on, the better performance you're going to have. Um, so I always try to go as long as the customer feels comfortable with. Um, but those are the those are the basic things that I look for just when we get started on on picking a pattern. Interesting. And uh, I mean, the shapes of them must affect that too. Do you just have a different feel for how different shapes will actually operate? Um, so a lot of it is experience. Um, and the other thing is, I tell people this. Um, like, you know, we were just at Oshkosh. So if you go around to Oshkosh and you look at every single airplane there, they almost all have a different propeller on them, a different shape, a different profile, and um, they all work. <laughs> so <laughs> They all got there. They all made it there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yes, there are little things that, that I do look for, and there's little things that, that I feel like make a prop better for certain projects or certain um, but in the very big, long, ski, you know, big, broad scheme of things, you can go with a variety of different blades and profiles and things like that because, you know, in generally, most of them will work. <laughs> but, um, but I do do little things. So um, if it's a fast plane and they are limited on their shape, then I will go with a square tip. Um, okay. It's just a little bit, but you're giving just that little extra bit of blade area that you didn't cut off. So, that's oh, that a makes sense. Thing. So, yeah, so you can go further out with a flattened tip if you're if you're limited on diameter. That makes sense. Right, and so um, then the other thing is you you do have a certain amount of you know blade area. So if a prop, if I'm having trouble holding the RPM, say it has a really high RPM engine and it's limited to a short diameter, you kind of have to go with a little bit more. Um, wider blade because mm. I want that to be absorbed through the blade. I can absorb it with pitch, um, but I don't feel like that's a good way to do it. So I generally try to kind of try to go with a little wider. Just kind of, like I said, it's kind of experience. What And that's the thing with experimental aircraft is generally people will put, there's so many different combinations. There's, there's you know, unlimited combinations of engines and airplanes out there. And then you also have to know, like, is it a really slick airplane? Did they do a really good job on it? Did they 
put really nice and slick, or did they put every gadget they could and it weighs twice what it should by the manufacturer's specifications? You know, <laughs> like, you just don't know. So you kind of got to take a little bit of that into consideration when you. It sounds like you're a little bit of a conversationalist sleuth when you talk to your customers. You like kind of figuring out, hmm, this one sounds like a perfectionist who's done an exceptionally good job and we can match him. And, and this guy mentioned duct tape and, uh, you know, uh, putting on like lots of GoPros way too often. <laughs> yeah. So everyone says, do I just fill out a form? Do I just fill out a form on your website? And I'm like, mm, no, that's not how that works. Call me. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and and have, I, it must be really satisfying at the end of the day to get all of that feedback from your customers on what really worked and, and get to see them, especially at the shows as you walk around, the ones that you've sold previously. Yeah, I, I don't get a ton of feedback, to be honest. Um, generally, no news is good news. So if they don't ever talk to me again, then I usually think it's because they're out flying and having fun, and that's great. <laughs> I like that. You should use that with everyone you ever come in contact with. That's a great <laughs> rule to have. <laughs> yes. That's I'm going to good... start doing that, too. If anyone doesn't talk to me again, it is because they're out flying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, let me show a few more pictures here that are fun, just because the the actual artistry, it, it, these are really stunning. Um, they melt my heart. I mean, this is this one is gorgeous that you have on here. What's this story? Um, so that is Blake and Sandy Thomas, and they're one of my favorite customers. I mean, I just love them to pieces. They're the nicest people ever. Um, they made that new fort, um, I believe it's 28, and um, they... Uh, can't remember what engine they have on. Anyway, it was just the perfect like little bit of scimitar with it, and they did such an amazing job on their plane. It's actually an award-winning plane, um, but it is just absolutely gorgeous, and they are wonderful people, and they're very involved about the color that they wanted it, and um, so it's just absolutely wonderful to build a prop, especially for a plane of that like that degree of of perfection. It was, I love it. <laughs> It, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. Let's take a look at another one here. This is a little bit a little bit more fun. So that one was really fun. Um, that was for um, the Genius Garage, and they built it. I think that it was the paint scheme that the that was the hundredth one built. Um, you know, back in World World War One days. So that was kind of, so they replicated that for Oshkosh, and he actually did the painting on that himself. So. He asked for it to be plain, and he painted that, hand painted that himself. So painting is is not something I enjoy. Um, it's I don't at all. And so I was happy when he said he wanted to do that. <laughs> so he did he he painted it before you gave it final painting, like coating on the end, or how did that work? Um, no, I put the the finish on it and everything, and then I told him the materials he could use that would not react with my top coat. Hmm. And do you usually have to worry about balance when you do any kind of painting after the fact on a propeller? Um, not usually. So I balance them to perfection. We're talking like if someone put a Kleenex on one end, you know, and it's like that made it balanced, I will balance it until it is perfect. Like we're talking nobody move, everybody stay still, I'm balancing a <laughs> propeller. So it's perfect when it leaves and so then generally a little thing like a little bit of paint um it, it's not enough to throw it yeah. out of tolerance and we've got some pictures of that so when we get into the process side of of things here and here's uh here's another one before we uh before we move on or a couple more before we move on to process so Is that's it? just um, a basic um a uh, maple propeller. Um, some people like to keep them a natural maple color. Some of them like them stains like Blake and Sandy's, but um, if I saw the paint scheme, I could probably remember that airplane, but I can't see the whole paint scheme. So now No, I'm... no worries at all. How about this? Um, his name is Richard Efton. <laughs> and, I like uh, how every single time I pull up a, a propeller, you're like, and this is the customer's name and exactly the information <laughs> about him. You don't think you become family working with Gulver Props. This is definitely saying the truth for that. So, um, when he wanted me to paint it white, I about fell over because I didn't want to paint my pretty wood. And then after I did it, I was completely in love with it. It matches his airplane so well. 
And I would have never done that on my own, but I was so glad that I did go ahead and do it because it really was absolutely stunning on his plane. <laughs> it is. I, I'm going to want to take a look and find some other pictures on that because to see the whole propeller, that is, that's a pretty unique thing to say the least. And, and of course, this is you um, uh, directly with, uh, uh, with a propeller. And that is a uh, pretty propeller there. So that is a 90 inch prop. And uh, it is one that grandpa designed. So number one, I love a radial engine, like love radial engines. And so the Rotec radial and the Werner radial engines that are newer modern radials that people are starting to put on their planes, um, they want that scimitar shape because that scimitar shape is just like that. It's just gorgeous. So grandpa actually designed that. And it is, it's also fun to sand. So the way the shapes all just melt, it, it sands really well. So that is probably one of my favorite profiles to do is one grandpa designed in just specifically for the radials. All right, so talk us through how this all starts. First of all, where do you get the wood and what wood do you use? Um, we get our woods at Kansas City and they hand select it for me, which is great. And then I hand select it again once it gets here. Um, we use maple, um, we use, this is what the maple looks like. This is mahogany, which is what I use to give my two-tone looks. Um, then I, I've used cherry before, but I don't use it often. And then birch. And I love to put birch and maple together. That's some of my favorite. But those are the types of wood that we use. Interesting. And is there are, are there reasons that, that you, you go with a certain wood in terms of for structural other than just uh, appearance? Or is most of it appearance? Um, most of it is appearance. Um, so with maple and mahogany, the way that got started is World War I replicas, all the Germans, uh, uh, German aircraft would be, um, uh, their most famous propeller maker was called Axial. And it was this big paddle blade and it was made of maple and mahogany like this. So a lot of my World War I guys who are very specific about the way they want their plane to look had mentioned that. And then when I started making a few and posting pictures, then everybody wanted them. <laughs> <laughs> so I do a lot of them um, and I love them. It's a little bit more difficult because mahogany sands so fast so you have to be careful to hit the maple a little harder and then you back off when you hit the mahogany so you don't dip the mahogany in and your blade stays nice and smooth but other than that it's a really great great wood to work with. Interesting I would never would have thought about that and and uh, and what about cherry how does that fit into the equation? Um, just somebody said they liked it they like it. It was pretty. <laughs> so um, I did that, and it was really, it really does make a gorgeous prop. So, um, but birch and maple are my go-to's, my favorites, the ones that I always keep in stock, the ones that I are are my absolute, like my base, my solid. If they said you can only do one wood from now on, it'd be maple. Wow. Mm. And and what's the color difference between the birch and the maple? Is the maple a little yellower then in general? It's pretty subtle. Um, it's a little bit darker, so it actually kind of looks like the heartwood of maple, um, but it is sometimes, and it's a little pinky. It's a little bit of a pink color, but um, just just a little bit, kind of just like a really good highlight in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I do my props like I do the highlighting in my hair. Perfect. <laughs> we got blondes, we got brunettes. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's, uh, here, these are your patterns. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so take me through how, uh, how you've told me how you decide kind of uh, talking to someone and figuring out what kind of uh, props going to be the right thing. Is this, is this your next stop? Yeah. So when I pick a pattern, um, I just look for the right diameter, rotation, and pitch. And then I find the pattern that's closest to that. Every pattern has a template. So um, I'll take that template and I'll lay it down on each board and mark it out. After I mark out um, all the boards and however many I need for hub thickness for what's required for the engine, then I will cut each board out individually and um, then you glue them up. Um, gluing them up is a, it's a, actually not a bad process. Um, it, you, uh, pot life is like 20 minutes on the glue, so you just sand them all down and then you um, glue them up and you put them in the press. It does have to be 70 degrees, which is sometimes tricky in a big shop in the middle of winter. And so, but we get the whole room to 70 degrees and then we will glue it up and it goes in the press for 14 hours at about 75 PSI. 
Wow. Now, we did get a few questions in while we were still talking about woods, and people want to know, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, is, are there any differences in terms of longevity or durability or anything else in when someone's choosing a, a wood to go with, or is it really just about aesthetics? Um, the most important thing is to keep the wood sealed. So I do get that a lot, like, what's the best wood? Well, they're all great, and they're all going to last probably 10 years easy as long as you take care of them properly. So it is all about the care of your propeller. People will say, well, how long does it last? It lasts as long as you take care of it. So if you trash it, you can trash one in the first like three, four days and it just be done. Or you can have it for 15 years and it look brand new. So it's all about keeping your varnish sealed and not letting any moisture get into it. And as long as you keep the moisture out, it's going to be fine. How does that work for, uh, I mean, if an aircraft ends up being outside overnight in the rain uh, or anything like that, is that, is it uh, because they're sealed, is that still okay? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't. Yeah, um, so they'd probably be okay like one night or something like that, and then you, you dry them off, but generally they need to be stored inside. They should not get wet. They can't fly in the rain. It'll actually eat your leading edge off. It'll look like it's been sandblasted, actually, even if you just get caught in a little rainstorm. Now, I can sand it out most of the time. Most of the time, they can send it back. They can say, I got caught in a little rain, and they'll send it back, and I'll just sand it out. I'll kind of reshape it a little bit, and you're fine, but it is a prop's worst enemy. Got it. That makes sense a lot. And and when you glue it, what type of glue are you using? Um, well, <laughs> we were using a DAP plastic weld wood resin until they quit making that as of yesterday. So, <laughs> oh my God. Happy Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've seen some videos that you like mix this up from powder and you just again it's an art you're figuring out the consistency based on how you feel about it yeah so I'll get to redo that um, with a different type um, so I'm kind of researching some stuff right now and and I do have options I have good proven options um, just working on deciding which one I want to go with and um, so I've got some ordered and I'll start testing those and We'll go from there, but yeah. <laughs> wow, that uh, it sounds like just like like a lot of people right now out in the supply chain world of supply chain, it it didn't leave you uh, un unscarred. Yeah, but that's okay. I mean, growing and evolving, um, that's what that's what it's all about. So we'll just grow and evolve and learn some more and keep going, yep. just like Grandpa did. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So you let you do a layup. Um, you, you put them all uh, into the, this uh, hydraulic press uh, and, and let it sit. Um, once you're done with that, does, is it time for me to show the, like, the, the super coolest machine like anywhere uh, uh, now? Or, or is there something you got to do before that? Uh, we drill the center pilot hole and the end detachment points. And then it's super awesome machine time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's show super awesome machine time, uh, in my opinion here. And uh, we've got a, a few pictures of this. Um, take us through this because I, I love this thing. <laughs> okay, so this is a tracing lathe. Um, when we originally got the company, uh, they had like, so they did, they had this, and then they had like three other machines that they put a prop through before it was ready to hand sand. So grandpa got in there and started messing with it, and he fixed it like, to the point where after it comes off this machine, I can take a prop and work on it with the belt sander for about 15 minutes and it's almost, you know, completely smooth. So he did amazing things with this machine to get it to where it is. And, but it's basically a tracing lathe. So I have my pattern in the top and I have my blank in the bottom and I will do a rough cut of one side. Then I'll take my bottom piece out, turn it around, and do a rough cut of the opposite side. And I do that to kind of keep it um, balanced a little bit. And then I will come back and I'm, of course, over cutting, cutting it. I'll come back and I'll set the pitch. So it's really technical, but to set the pitch, I take a piece of metal and put it underneath the hub and adjust the angle of it. And uh, then I check the pitch and see <laughs> what it um what it came out to be and then it, if i need more or less i'll add another shim underneath it to angle it a little bit more and then i'll make another cut so i have about five chances to get the pitch right 
on that and then I will do a final cut on one blade and a final cut on the other blade and then it'll be um, ready to sand. So it takes about 30 minutes per blade. So it can take me two, two to three hours to do one. So it's only 30 minutes for that, that tracing machine to go through and duplicate one of your, uh, one of, one of your templates there to that, that stack up that you basically just cut out and cleaned up just slightly from the press. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty, it's a workaholic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the angle you said is done just by sh a little bit of shimming in there at the hub so that when the tracing happens, it's actually tracing it at a slightly different pitch. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is, that is, that is really cool. <laughs> I'm so, a, bit of a, then, a bit of a machine geek, so I, I, I like that. Well, the other great thing that Grandpa did was um, he made it so it will, um, the bottom one will spin opposite. So what that allowed me to do is any right-handed patterns I have that I need to make a left-hand version of, I can um, take that one of the sprockets and put it from the top to the bottom and flip a switch on the back of the machine and it will make a right-handed pattern off of a left-handed pattern. Oh so my goodness, that is happens. so cool. So it's basically like flipping the chain the other way and then you make a reverse of it. Yep. Wow, that's very, it's, man, it, and it sounds like you had a machine that was around there for a long time, and then, and, and then when the company was bought, he just, he just still saw how to improve on this. Yep, yep, that was Grandpa. He, did, uh, he but, could have improved about anything. <laughs> <laughs> put two more, put, put two more uh, machines out of business in the process. So uh, this looks like it's a little, little more refined of a cut stage. Um, yeah, so that's that's taking just the, the last little bit off and um, This part is where it's super important to read your pattern and how your machine is cutting that day because You know how your blades are it's like are your blades super nice and sharp or are they getting dull? Because you want to have a good trailing edge on that if you don't have a thin trailing edge then I mean, it's, that's one of the most important parts. So you kind of keep track of how it's cutting and pay close attention to that because this is the stage that makes or breaks that trailing edge. Wow. And this is just another another picture. This one should have been earlier, but this is the roughest stage it looks like when that first goes on there. Yeah, yeah. And some mm -hmm. of the World War One replicas are so deep in the cut because that saw blade is only 10 inches. So it's a 10 inch, 10 tooth saw blade on the bottom. And some of the World War Ones, the, the cut is so deep that it's deeper than that saw blade can do. So um, you you just, you let it make a few cuts and then you take a chainsaw and cut. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, dad did it the first time. And then, then after I saw how he did it, I was able to do it the second time. But so... There's lots of ways to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of saying it. I've seen a lot of chainsaw art. I haven't seen anyone make a propeller and hand it to someone with a chainsaw. <laughs> so. Here's you doing some more work. <laughs> yeah, so after after that, I will do, um, I'll cut the hub out to the size that it needs to be on the bandsaw, and then I come over and I sand it with this drum sander. So um, each prop, each, each engine has, you know, a bolt pattern. That bolt pattern will have a face size that the hub needs to be for that. Um, so I trace all those out and then cut off all the extra with the bandsaw and then um, come over to this drum sander and, and sand that out. And blending that hub to the blade is kind of one of, it's one of the more difficult parts. I struggled with it for a really long time, um, but uh, I eventually got it. <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, and and are you usually flat on the the part that's that the part that goes around the hub itself and obviously where the plate goes I mean that obviously all has to be flat but are different props can they be a little bit bowed in between the plates or is there any is there any art artistry to that part of it? Um, no, so right there at the hub between your crush plate and your drive flange that has to be completely flat like that's your tracking. Mm -hmm. All that yep. so that part stays completely straight but that blend from that to the blades yeah you can it can be you know different shapes and things like that different and that's Got fine it. and then we talked about the press earlier this is it at work oh uh, yep there's grandpa explaining how it works <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yep, you just hook an air hose to it, and those are 18-wheeler airbags at the bottom, and they all just fill up, and it comes and just smashes it, like, evenly. And the old company, um, the previous owners weren't even using that. They were screwing it all down by hand, so um, I was thankful they dug that out and used it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have changed things quite a bit. What's this stage? Um, this is me putting the pattern in. Um, that just the first stage, putting the pattern in. Um, you always like to index it off of the side that is going to be against the engine. So that is actually on a pusher configuration. Mm -hmm. So, but yep, just putting the pattern in the lathe. And then we just have a few more here to, to show different stages of a building. And now you mentioned earlier about your, your, perfection in balancing and there's a couple different ones uh, here showing it in different orientations yeah so balancing is the part that can make you go crazy um <laughs> you can work on it for an hour sometimes it'll take three hours it just depends um but it is it is one of the most crucial parts so we balance them vertically and horizontally and if you don't do it right you're going to have a vibration and things are going to go bad so um, it is the most important part to making sure that you're that it runs smoothly and I take the longest time working on that And and is this it looks like just just a rod right through the center for balancing? Yeah, it's just static balanced on that stand um, And you just want it to sit there if it self rotates. That's not good <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> No, no, not at all. Now, what do you what do you do to get it to bounce? Where are you taking material off or adding? Um, so horizontally, I will take um, I will take material off the back of the prop. So, but I want to take it evenly because I don't want to change the pitch. So, I will just very lightly take it off the blade. Um, but also, you don't want to take too much because if you take well, here, if you take too much off, then you're going to change um, the tracking of it, and it's not going to track evenly with each other. So you just take it very, very evenly, very smoothly, very carefully off this whole blade, the back here. Um, I generally don't want to take any off the front because I don't want to change this airfoil here. So oh, it got all it, got it. So we call that, I mean, certain in the certified world, that would be the face of the prop that you're working on, the flat surface, and that's right. where you're that's where you're taking it down, but without affecting tracking. Right, so then for vertically, I take it off right in here. And you just wanna take it off anywhere that you're not going to be able to see it. So if I take it off the hub right here where it's supposed to be perfectly round, then when the customer puts their crush plate on it, they're gonna see that it's not even, and we don't want that. So you take it off in places that you wouldn't normally see. So I can take it off at the hub, um, where the hub meets the blade right here is the most common ways to make it balance vertically. Oh wow. That is that is an art. And 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 you're doing that to the point that you can put a tissue on and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yep. So Wow. And so the difference in those sides is holding it vertically as you showed uh, versus holding it horizontally. I didn't realize you have to kind of balance it both ways. Yeah, and you can have it balanced perfectly horizontally and um, then fix the vertical and your horizontal will be gone again. So you get to go back and forth just one <laughs> <another. laughs> It's fun. <laughs> wow, so, then, and then, so basically you get it all perfect, it's balanced there, you can do the tissue test or whatever you need, you put it vertical and then it tilts just a little bit on you? Yep, go back, start oh, over. <laughs> wow, that is absolutely uh, crazy, um, but uh, but really amazing. And so, like, what are the so what are the finishing touches then? You've got this this beautiful artwork ready uh, propeller that's now perfectly balanced, and um, and and what's the last steps of getting it to a customer, or getting it finished or, or coated? Or do they all have the same coating? Um, yeah. So uh, some of my World War One replicas like a lower sheen. So I may do like a 35 sheen. Um, my most common is like 65 sheen, and uh, I'm I'm playing with high gloss, but you have to be really good with high gloss and <laughs> working on it. And um, but no, they get the bolt pattern drilled. That's one of the last things you do is drill the bolt pattern, and then it gets a coat of sealer. 
Um, like we talked about, it's like an antifungal, really important sealer. And then you get the top coat, which is where all your protection comes from. So it's a really hard, durable top coat. Anything uh, uh, that can be done for leading edge protection? There is a leading edge tape. Um, I think Wix, Aircraft Spruce, they all sell a leading edge tape. Uh, it's not, um, we don't do any leading edge or anything like that. Um, I try to keep my props as, as bait. I wouldn't say basic, but the more you add, the more problems you can have. So I try to keep them very simple and streamlined and easy to take care of. Yeah. I mean, quite a few people have asked the questions about, like, what about metal leading edges and things like that? Um, uh, and, and I assume from what you're saying that you don't get involved in that. No, no. I just uh, just leave them like that. Leading edges are, um, well, I don't know enough about them, honestly. I don't know enough about them to feel comfortable doing it to start with. Um, I do love them. They're gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. But um, yeah, just not something I'm ready to get into. Right. Now, one thing that you did tell me is you th th there's a pretty, pretty big mix of different types of propellers that you get involved in. I mean, we've talked about the ones for experimentals where someone comes to you and they let you know all about their build, what they want to do, the speed, et cetera, and you pick one for them. That's only a piece of it though, right? Um, you also told me you do a lot of work that's really, really unique with museums. Yes, <laughs> so that's some of my some of my funnest things is um, uh, so like old Rhinebeck. Um, so they have an albatross, and that's one of my favorite airplanes. Um, and I got to make a prop for their albatross, which I really really love because it's keeping aviation history alive. So you know that's where we started. Um, I love World War One and World War Two history. Those are the audio books I listen to whenever I'm sanding. <laughs> so um, to be able to build props for planes that I listen to in books and stuff like that and keep that history alive is just like that's just what that's that's one of my favorite favorite things to do. <laughs> that is, uh, and I, you know, I'll tell people who may not be familiar with it if if you have a chance, upstate New York, um, old in Ryan Beck, New York specifically. Uh, which is just north of Poughkeepsie, Dutchess County Airport, you can fly into. Uh, old Rhinebeck, New York, uh, has this, their aerodrome is just spectacular. If anyone has a chance to go out there, they are the ones keeping, maintaining, flying, and doing air shows on a regular basis with World War I aircraft. It is it, it is a sight to, to behold, and so I just want to do a quick promo for them, because if you want to go see one of Elena's props... <laughs> Right. That is a great place to go see it. So, yeah, great, so, great stuff. The other right. thing, of course, these are these are art, and um, people come to you just for propellers for for artworks purposes. Yeah. So, um, a lot of times, I get requests for um, props for wedding books, like guest guest books for their wedding. Um, sometimes. Honestly, some of my favorite are wives that call and want these props for their husbands because they have like designs in mind and they want to look like this and they want to match that, which which is great for me because um, it's nice because you you can really get like like really design specific and they have some really neat ideas. So I love doing that um, for them and they make you know they give them to their husbands for Christmas or sometimes I have people do them for solos. If someone solos, I'll stamp their solo date in the hub where the serial number would go um things like that they're really really fun to get kind of decorative about them and uh, kind of not have to worry about the specs and i can just really kind of play and get creative with it it's a lot of fun that's so awesome now i i i don't even understand the first thing you said was for wedding books what hold on tell me what that actually is how how does a propeller work for a wedding book so just whenever you come in, you know, you'll say you sign the wedding guest book, but instead everybody just signs the propeller and the propeller is just laying there and all <laughs> the guests sign it and they have all, and they usually just display it in their home and they have their wedding guest book for everybody to see. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is the best idea. At least if you're a guy who loves airplanes, like <laughs> that's you one awesome. Thing, you get one thing, one, one thing you get to pick about the wedding, pick that. <laughs> 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 it's like, I, all you have to say is, yes, I'm, um, I'm going to pick the, our guest book. Would that be okay? The thing that people sign in? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can pick that. <laughs> yep, there you go. <laughs> so 
Tell me, uh, there's a lot going on in the shop. Can't be just you, uh, or I, I'm hoping, I am hoping it, that, there, that there's me. You've got your kids at work. Or who else makes up the shop on a regular basis? Um, on a regular basis, my kids. My kids are there all day, every day. Um, they're really troopers. They really are. Um, then my brother comes and helps me um, half days, so, um, a few days a week. And my husband drills my bolt patterns. And my dad comes and fixes anything that I break. So, <laughs> and there are a lot. <laughs> but he fixes everything that I break. Um, he, he, we, we talk about, you know, if I'm having any kind of problems, he comes in and helps me and figures out um, ways to do it and ways to get it done. And um, so he's consulting. And then my grandma comes up and cleans up all my messes I made. She'll say, <laughs> look at this shot you've been making messes all day and she'll come in and she gets the bandsaw and cuts up all my wood scraps and puts them all in boxes and puts them places, stuff some places. And uh, <laughs> so she's up there uh, probably every day for maybe an hour. We'll drink coffee and then she cleans up all my messes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. What a life. That is just, that's just wonderful. And I know you've got customers propellers next to you right there. In fact, you, you told me the one one that's on, on your left, on our right, is, is one that's also kind of a decorative one that was there. Um, the yeah. dark wood one to your left, what's, what's the story on that one? So this one is actually made out of something called Bobinga. And it's, I hope I'm saying that right, but like, don't go quote me. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes I make up words, but um, anyway, it is, I had a customer who had, he was making a peaton pole and he did the whole entire um, interior with Babinga and he wanted his prop to match his interior. And so he said, would you try to make one out of, out of this wood? And I said, sure. So I bought it and I did, I made it and I sent it to him and it's actually very, very heavy wood. Um, and it is not fun to work with. It's not. <laughs> it, it's right here. This is the last one. And it's just, it, so I made it out of the scraps, the stuff that was left over from his prop. Um, but yeah, last one. No, <laughs> one's, gonna, no, one's, no one's gonna be getting another Babanga wood uh, propeller. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh my! And then the, the last thing I want to make sure before we run out of time here is, you know, you you do a lot more than just propellers. I know that uh, you were very gracious with your time to join us here on Social Plate Live. You are involved in a bunch of things with your kids. I mean, fill us in on the super mom side of things too. Oh, <laughs> well, um, I have really, really great two girls, nine and 11, and um, they both play softball and they're both in 4-H. So we have um, sheep. We have, we have two sheep <laughs> and uh, we have <laughs> chickens. Yeah, that's it's true. And we have chickens. We have probably 40, 50 chickens, show chickens. Um, I'm our poultry leader for our 4-H group. Um, but between... I'm going to let you know right now, out of Boston, I have no idea what a show chicken is. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so, so to make it quick, there people breed chickens to... There's, there's a book called The Standard of Perfection, and it tells you exactly what each breed is supposed to look like all the way down to the angle of their tail. I mean, it's specific. And um, so, so my girls um, actually have their own breeding program where they have their own chickens and they breed towards the standard of perfection for poultry that they show. We went to Ohio, we went to Tennessee. We, um, yeah, so we travel in three. That's awesome. They're easy to travel with. But anyway, so, Mostly that's it, softball. And then I help grandma with the farm. Grandma still has her, um, she has an 800 acre farm. She lives on by herself and takes care of herself. And oh uh, she has about, a, yeah, she has about a hundred head of cattle that, um, uh, you know, the whole family helps her with. But uh, my brother does most, my dad and my brother do a lot of the land management. And then I, I help take care of the cattle and stuff like that. So um that, that's generally where our extra time goes. <laughs> that's awesome. And then after all that, of course, big shout out to grandma who then comes up and cleans up your messes. Cleans up my messes. <laughs> just ask her. She'll tell you. <laughs> I'm sure she will. Well, Elena, I just want to thank you so, so much for sharing your story with us here at Social Polite Live, for letting people know so much about what goes into making a wooden propeller and helps keep general aviation going. That's 
that's the reason that we're here. That's why we started the show is to get inspirational people that make up general aviation. And boy, are you one of them. So thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on and, uh, and yeah, it's been great. I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I was really good. I'll <laughs> yeah, be sure before you go, tell everyone how, how do they find you? Um, I'm on Instagram at Culver Props and I'm on Facebook and small YouTube channel. Um, but mostly, and Instagram is probably, um, uh, probably my, the one I pay the most attention to. So, and, and we do have a website, but Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Excellent. Excellent. And just look up Culver Props for anyone out there. If, if in any way a, a wooden propeller is in your future for your aircraft or just something that you need because you're getting married and you need a guest book, then um, be sure to check that out. Um, I, I can't imagine getting a, a propeller with more handmade care as one coming from Elena. And so with that, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening, Elena. And, uh, and thanks to all of you, of course, for taking time out of your evening to join us again here on Social Flight Live. We will be back next Tuesday, uh, August 17th. Rick Peterson, air show announcer extraordinaire, will be with us. The following Tuesday, Rick Perry of the Aviation Electronics Association is with us. And then we're gonna be back on the 31st with Vic Syracuse talking all about experimental aircraft maintenance and airworthiness. So lots and lots more fun to come. So until next time again, thank you very much, Elena. And I thank wish you. you all blue skies. Good night, everybody.